This video is brought to you by Squarespace. From websites and online stores to tools and analytics, Squarespace is the all-in-one platform to build a beautiful presence and run your business. Welcome back, everyone. Last week, I did a video on Sony's announcement of their new Ultra Compact Prime lenses. In fact, there are three of these now. We're going to talk specifically today about the 24mm f2.8. I had an interesting question from someone that wanted to know what the biggest difference is between this and Sony's other 24mm, the G Master f1. 1.4 version were going to be. And of course, you know, this lens is more than double the cost of the Ultra Compact Prime. And so this is designed at a much cheaper price point. This has much more glass in it, bigger elements, XA glass. It's a f1.4 lens. And so, of course, performance is going to be better. But how do they compare up? I thought this was an interesting idea. So I went ahead and did some tests. I did a bunch of shots. I want to share these with you today. The results came back and I was actually pretty surprised at how well a performer the 24 millimeter f2.8 G actually is. So what we're going to do is uh, look at some visual examples and hopefully we'll give you a little bit of an overview that'll explain it. And if you want to dive a little deeper, we'll do that later in the video because this kind of gets pretty interesting. The first thing that I like to do when I'm looking at a lens's performance is actually looking at the field of focus. And so there's a little test that you can do. I encourage you guys to do this with lenses that you guys own. I completely stole this from Roger Sakala over at Lens Rentals. So thank you, Roger. And I'm serious. This is a really cool way to evaluate a lens. And I want to show you what it is that we're looking at. So we're going to make a test image and it doesn't really matter what it is so much. It just needs to be something flat that has texture to it. In this case, I'm photographing the street and I prefer to do this at a low angle. And what you're going to do is you're going to put your point of focus right in the middle of the image and you're going to create that image. What we want to do is we want to bring this into Photoshop and you're going to use something called the find edges filter. Now this filter is kind of interesting. It doesn't really do much. There's no options, but what it does is it creates sort of a map of what the highest point of detail are in the image so we can look at this at sharpness. And so you're going to see that line that runs across the middle of the image there. And what that is, is that is the field of focus. Now, what's interesting is we can start to judge some of the characteristics of the lens by what we see in that field of focus. So the first thing that you're going to look at here is you're going to notice that in the middle of the screen, this is, let me grab the tool here, this is my sharpest area right here. Now, you're going to see that as we move towards the sides of the screen, and you could also shoot this diagonally if you want to actually see full corner to corner, but you're going to see these areas are less sharp than what you see in the middle. See, it's much more black, much more dense here, and it kind of starts to fall off. And so that's essentially what you're looking at uh, in terms of this line. The other thing you're going to see, and I'm going to sort of attempt to draw this here, but you're going to see that the line is not perfectly straight. It kind of comes in, it goes down, it goes back up again, and then out. This is a little bit, uh, you know, oversimplified here in my bad drawing skills, but this is very typical in a 20 24 millimeter focal length. A 24 millimeter lens is actually somewhat difficult for manufacturers to make. In fact, when the G Master lens came out, that was such a big deal because it was such a high performer compared with Canon EF mount offerings or Nikon F mount offerings. We didn't have Z mount yet. We didn't have RF mount yet. So things have changed a little bit. But anyway, I digress. What we're looking at here is what we refer to as a mustache shaped distortion. So it just has a wave to it. And it means that at 24 millimeters, it's really hard to get something in focus straight across um, a lot of compensation has to be done in the lens design itself. And so this only matters is if you're shooting something straight, it could drift out of focus. So architecture, a line of people, for instance. Other thing to note about this, and I should have done more images so I could show you, but as you move that focus point back, let's say it was back towards closer to infinity or more up towards the minimum focus distance, the shape can change and intensify a little bit. It doesn't change the shape, but it pronounces it somewhat. And so it's something to understand too. So obviously a lens that has this mustache distortion is something that is not really preferable unless it's pronounced. And in this case, um, this is actually pretty well dealt with. This is, you know, they, they found a way to actually get this evened out somewhat. And so this makes it a pretty good performer. Of course, as you stop the lens down from f2.8, if you are shooting architecture, it's going to make a wider depth of field or a deeper depth of field. And so more will be in focus. So it's going to be less of an issue. But what's interesting is if we compare this, this is the f2.8 G lens. If you compare this to the f1.4 G Master, you're going to see that we have a much straighter line. There is still a slight minimum wave, but you can see how these compare. 
It's also much more shallow because it's a wider aperture, but you can see that it maintains a little more integrity towards the corners than let's say the f2.8 does. It just kind of tends to scatter a little more. So that's one of the big differences that you're going to be looking at with these lenses. Creating a field of focus map like this is going to give you a pretty good general understanding of what you can expect in terms of performance out of a lens. And we're talking about things like contrast, resolution, sharpness, detail, that sort of thing, how it works in the center of the lens and how you might lose that going edge to edge or you could expect to keep it. And so having that in mind, that's not typically a real world example. So it's time to take that application and go get some real world examples. So what I did this morning is I went and just shot around the neighborhood for a few hours and I used both lenses and I compared them both wide open, even though one is an F1.4, the other is an F2.8. I compared them both stop down at 5.6, F8, so on and so forth, just to see what the differences were going to be in performance. Some of these were done on a tripod, some of these were done handheld. Now, speaking of aperture and depth of field, the G Master version, the f1.4, has a clear advantage. Now, with the f2.8 version, you can get some nice fall off and a little bit of bokeh, especially for a wide angle lens if you're close enough to your subject. When you switch over to the f1.4, this is where the 1.4 has a really serious advantage. It gives you a much shallower depth of field, a beautiful fall off, really beautiful bokeh. I think that Sony have done an outstanding job with the G Master in that regard. So, the G lens is an f2.8, so it's at a slight disadvantage when we're comparing depth of field. But in other ways, there are other things to look for than just depth of field. For instance, when we made that field of focus map, remember the f2.8 version of this lens was sharpest in the center and where there was a noticeable fall off in detail as we moved towards the edge of the frame. What's well, something I wanted to test here with both lenses. So what I did here is you're looking at a 60 megapixel image. This is with my Sony a7R4. This is with the 1.4 version of this lens, actually. I'll start here. And so if we move up to the top right hand corner here, we, one of the lovely things about Texas is we have all these dead trees which are great for testing sharpness and detail, and you can actually see that going on here. So this is the f1.4 version. If I move over to the f2.8 version, you're going to notice, put these side by side, you can notice that it is a lot less sharp than the f1.4 version is, and that was to be expected. But I wanna show you something that I found that I didn't expect. If we look at the f1.4 version, you're gonna notice that we start to see purple fringing. That is pretty much absent on the f2.8 version. So though we have a trade-off in terms of sharpness corner to corner with the f2.8 with the f1.4 it is sharper but the sacrifice is a little bit of purple fringing which can be fixed in post i haven't touched these you're seeing these unedited but that is an important note to make the other thing i want to talk about with chromatic aberration is that a lot of lenses have chromatic aberrations this is something that people tend to make i think a too big of a deal about chromatic aberration happens when you have a lens that's going to exhibit it it's in high contrast fine detail areas like an edge where you have something black against something white. So in the case of the trees, we have black edges against kind of mm, somewhat going white sky or a bluish sky. So it's a high contrast area and this is where we're gonna start to see the purple fringing. There's another type of chromatic aberration where you actually get green fringing. It's a little harder to solve in post-production, but anyway, either way, it depends on what you're shooting. It depends on compositionally what you're going to be doing, what your lighting is like. And I don't know, sometimes it exhibits it, but it's such a fine detail that it's just not, worth worrying about and you're never gonna find the perfect lens. Some lenses manage it better than others. I just wanna put my two cents in there that I think a lot of people make way too much a big deal about this stuff. The other thing is when you stop down the lens, it will start to correct it and I did some tests with that as well. So if you take the 24 millimeter, for example, and you shoot something, this is the, sorry, the G Master version, you have something in the corner where you're gonna get that purple fringing. This is wide open. When I stop that lens down to about F2.8 or so, you can see that it cleans up considerably. Of course, we're kind of comparing an Apple to an orange here because we're comparing two lenses at two different apertures and the design couldn't be any different. But when you look at the MTF for the 24 millimeter f2.8, it is still really impressive. And this competes, I think, in terms of contrast and resolution anyway, with lenses that come in at much higher price points. So Sony has come out swinging with these compact primes. Both lenses do have a little bit of vignetting. It's nothing that's going to be so intense that you can't fix it in post. And it's better than I've seen on some lenses. This becomes a bigger problem with a bigger sensor like medium format and a wide angle lens, but I thought it was pretty much fair that they both clean up pretty easily in here. Flare and Sunstars, I've never really thought this was Sony's thing. If you want Flare and Sunstars, I think Voigtlander lenses, there's some other options that are going to give you a much better gimmick if that's what you're into. Focus breathing is interesting as well. This is another thing people seem to be overly concerned about these days, and I guess it is an issue if you're doing video with these. So focus breathing, I'm going to give a nod actually to the G version, the F2.8. It exhibits much 
less focused breathing, where there is slightly more and slightly noticeable focused breathing with the F1.4 G Master. A lot of this is going to have to do with the size of this lens, how far those elements are moving, so on and so forth. But uh, if you're doing video, I think that the 24 millimeter G, the F2.8, probably is a little bit better choice if you're doing a lot of focus pulls. So unfortunately, there is one big flaw with the 24 millimeter F2.8 G lens, and it's something that if you're actually considering getting this lens, you should know about. And so I want to get into that, but real quick, I want to give a shout out to our sponsor today, who are the awesome folks over at Squarespace.com. Squarespace is the easiest way to build a website, photo gallery, or online store without having to write a single line of code. Start with one of their gorgeous templates, use their drag and drop interface, build your brand online. But Squarespace is way more than just a way to build a website. Squarespace provides an amazing set of tools to create revenue and run a business. Squarespace now features dedicated member areas, allowing you to connect with your audience and generate revenue through members only content. You can manage members, you can send them email communications, and you can leverage audience insights. Building an e-commerce site couldn't be any easier, and Squarespace now also supports collecting donations. So you can get support for a cause or charity by gathering contributions with PayPal, Apple Pay, Stripe, and Venmo, and build your audience using social sharing. The Squarespace blogging platform has a sharing button that you can customize that's going to allow sharing on Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, StumbleUpon, Reddit, Pinterest, and Tumblr. So head over to Squarespace for a free trial. Once you feel that Squarespace is right for you, I can save you an additional 10% on your first order by using offer code AOP on checkout or just use the link below this video. Once again, that offer code is AOP and I wanna give a special shout out and thanks to the the awesome folks at Squarespace for sponsoring this video. So at the time I'm filming this, these lenses are not actually available other than pre-order at this point. So Sony were nice enough to send me all three of these lenses to evaluate and do some test images and share my results with you guys. So typically when you get lenses from any manufacturer, sometimes Lightroom doesn't support the lens profiles just yet. And that is definitely the case here. And what you're gonna see in the case of Lightroom is that we have some severe distortion. This was actually kind of a little bit surprising to me because even Sony, I've seen and evaluated most of the lenses in their lineup and there usually is some correction, maybe just a little bit, but not like this. What Sony have done is they've made a design compromise in this lens where they're going to allow the software to handle that post-production. So if you're shooting in-camera JPEGs or if you're shooting video, this is going to be corrected in camera. So you're not going to notice any of this distortion. If you're shooting raw, then you're going to bring it into Lightroom. And by the time these lenses are available, I'm sure Lightroom will be updated with the correct profile. But this is a lot. And what's interesting is they've made that compromise just saying, well, we're going to let the software deal with it. Well, there is an argument with that where you can lose a little bit of sharpness and detail. And that is true. If, for instance, when I go into Capture One and I toggle between the uncorrected version and the corrected version, you're going to see that it gets corrected and you lose just a little bit of sharpness. Of course, you have to be completely zoomed in to see this and you're pixel peeping. And I would even bet that most people are not going to see a difference between these two. But if it's something that's really important to you, you're probably considering a lens at a higher price point anyway. I just wanted to point this out. Now, there are other companies that do this all the time. Nikon is one of them. Fujifilm actually does it. What they do is they have baked in profiles. So when they hit Lightroom, even if you're shooting raw, you would never know. You'll know because when you go down to that panel, it just says built in and there's no adjustments that you can make on it, that they've done some work behind the scenes. But anyway, I was just thought that was interesting because I've never actually seen that on a Sony lens before that severe of a difference. Now, it's still great. All the images that I've showed you, I did do manual correction on and I still think this is an incredible lens especially at this price point. Like I said earlier we're comparing an apple to an orange here because these are two different lenses designed for two different price points and I thought that would be interesting to point out here actually because 24 millimeters is a hard focal length design for you're starting to get into wide territory it's very difficult for a lot of manufacturers and when you probably be more fair to compare this lens to another budget conscious 24 millimeter lens I just don't have one on hand and I wanted to show you guys what went into a lens. Now having said that, when we talk about lens design, one thing I don't think that a lot of people realize is that you have a team that designs a lens at any of these companies, and there's a set of restraints that are put on any lens that's being designed. And these can be things like, oh, it has to come in at this price point. So that's going to limit you in terms of what you're going to be able to do with glass elements. Um, it has to be a certain size. That's going to put a lot of limitations on what you're able to do. So a lot of these are probably challenges to any optics designer, but they exist. One thing that's very impressive is all three of these Sony Compact Primes that they, they announced 
are really incredible performing lenses. I've been really impressed with all three of them. The distortion is the only flaw on the 24 and I'm not even sure it's a big deal breaker in the end. But the other thing to notice is that all three of these lenses are in the exact same housing. So that was another constraint. You're gonna do three different lenses. They're all gonna be in the same package. You gotta make it happen. They're all three different focal lengths. So it's a really interesting problem that, that Sony have solved here. And I think these are amazing for the price point. They didn't just put out cheap compact primes. They put out some of the best compact primes that you can buy on any system. And of course, another thing that I wanna throw out there is when we look at all the technical data, it really means nothing because a lot of this is going to come down to what kind of a photographer you are, what it is that you shoot. And I'll give you an example. So let's just take sharpness edge to edge. So we have a sharpest point in the center. It falls off a little bit on the corners. It's not as high a detail. This is something that if you have one photographer and this individual shoots a lot of portraits or family shots or street photography, and usually the subject is somewhat near the the middle of the frame, it's not going to be as big of a deal because the, the important parts of the photograph are not being scrutinized. But if you have another photographer, somebody who shoots architecture or landscape, and that edge to edge sharpness is extremely important, that individual is going to think very differently of the exact same lens. So you've just got to figure this stuff out and decide whether it's right for the stuff that you do. These are compact primes. They come in at a cheaper price point. And I think for somebody who's on a budget that wants a lens that's going to be super portable, super light, lightweight that they can kind of throw around and carry anywhere. Pair this up with the A7C, that's a system that now makes sense because it's ultra compact and I think it gives some really interesting choice. If you're traveling lighter, you're going to shoot more and you're going to get better images in the end. Would love to know what you guys think, so drop me a comment below. I'll catch you guys in the next video. Until then, later.